This is us. This is us. Uh, I know some of you see that title or you saw the preview about that and you thought about the TV show. I'll admit to you, I've never seen the TV show. Uh, I also didn't name this sermon series that we're starting this morning about the TV show, so I'm not plugging it or recommending it, but I'm sorry to disappoint the few of you who love that show in the audience. Uh, I will say, though, what I know about that show is that it's all about family. It's all about family and the way they interact and live with each other, and that is really what our sermon series we're starting this morning is all about. I, If I asked you some of these questions, how would you respond? I don't want you to respond out loud today, but think about this for a second. Who are we? Who are we? You might think in your head, well, we're Christians. We're saved people. We're the church. Those are all correct, but in terms of what we're thinking about this week and the following weeks, I want us to be far more specific than that. Who are we? as the Choctaw Church of Christ. This local congregation, who are we as a people? You might ask it this way, what are we all about? If you had to take us as a group of people and simplify it, boil it all down to a few actions, what would you say we're all about? What is it that makes us us? What is it that when someone comes in this building and meets us, or they meet us in our day-to-day life, or they join this family, what is it that you would say, well, that makes, that's what makes that group that group? How would the people in our community that we interact with every single day, week in and week out, what would they say to those questions? Who would they say we are? What would they say we're all about? Those are some questions to think about because this morning we're starting a sermon series about This Is Us. And the idea is we're exploring who we are and what we're all about as the Church of Christ in Choctaw. We want to get to the heart of who we are as a people. And so if you're visiting with us this morning, what a great opportunity to to discover with us in the coming weeks. Hey, this is who we are as a people. This is who we're trying to be. These are the actions or the purposes and intentions we're trying to be about. Now, we're flawed and we're not perfect, but this is who we're trying to be. This series came about as I was reading Acts 2. There is a passage within Acts 2 that paints a portrait of an absolutely beautiful church, of a church family, of a people that you could not ignore if you met them. And in many ways, that church you read of in Scripture looks far different than what our society thinks of when they simply hear the word church. And so what I would like to do this morning is just introduce a concept about this is us. This is who we're trying to be as a church in Choctaw. This is an introductory lesson. I'll I'll tell you something I told Mike this morning. This is the first time I've ever gotten to preach a series of sermons ever. I've been a random one time here one time there guy i'm like a pinch hitter in a lot of ways and this is the first time i'm getting to start at like first base in a way so this is pretty exciting for me Uh, but also i've never done an introductory lesson how do you introduce a subject without talking too much about your subject how do you introduce something without wasting everyone's time and they're like cool you talked a lot about what we're going to talk about so Today, what we're going to start off with is this. Before we can go into a few actions that we're all about, I want us to understand this this morning. Before we can say, this is us, this is who we are as a church, we must remember why there is an us. I want us to take a few steps back and say, why is there an us anyway? Why are we all here this morning? Why did you and I join this body of people? Why do we come when, on Sunday morning and Wednesday night? Why do we have this relationship that we have with each other? And so what I want to do is step back and say, let's remember why there's in us before we get to who we are in the coming weeks. And what we're going to do is I want us to open up our Bibles to Acts chapter 2, to the beginning of the chapter. And I want us to look at the story of how this church that we're going to be studying about, how they became to be in us. And And their story of how they became to be a church is quite similar to ours. So this morning, real briefly, look at Acts chapter 2. And we're going to just take a few things about this church as we see their story. And we have the verses up here too. First thing we should notice about this church is, well, before we jump into that, Acts chapter 2, here's where we pick up to set the scene. 
Uh, there is uh, resurrected Jesus in, in Acts chapter 1 who has just ascended. He had spent a period of 40 some days, the Bible says, after his resurrection appearing to people. Uh, and then now he has ascended and he tells the apostles, his 12, wait in Jerusalem. The promised Holy Spirit is going to come. And when it comes, you will be my witnesses. And so in Acts chapter 2 and verse 1, where we start is you have the apostles in Jerusalem. They're waiting for the Spirit to come. And what we will read is the miraculous Spirit comes upon them and they begin to testify. Peter will stand up. He will preach the first gospel sermon on the day of Pentecost where thousands and maybe millions of Jews from all over have come to one central location because this is a Jewish pilgrimage festival. It's one of three feasts that you would have as a Jew. And so here's everyone here. Peter will begin to preach. The rest of the apostles will translate it into languages that they didn't know themselves. And we see this incredible event that took place and how this church became to be. A few things we can notice about these people from the get-go is this. They were a diverse group of people. Pick up in verse 5 of Acts chapter 2. It says, Now there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And at the sound the multitude came together, and they were bewildered because each one was hearing them speak in his own language. And they were amazed and astonished, saying, Are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear, each of us in his own native language, Parthians and Medes and Elamites and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, uh, Phrygia, if I'm saying that right. That sounds like one of almost our Indian towns in Oklahoma that no one can pronounce. You know what I'm talking about? Pamphylia, Egypt, and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabians, we hear them telling in our own tongues the mighty works of God. So you see it happening. The spirits come, they're preaching, and they're preaching in all these languages that are not known to these apostles because the spirit's at work. But I want you to notice what he said there. Devout Jews from under where? From every nation. Now they have something in common. They're Jews under the law, living, living as God's people or under the law at the time that it, was, that it was. But yet they all come to a central place, but they're from different areas. They're from different cultures. They're from different places. They speak different languages. All these people are different. They have different jobs. They have different financial uh, situations. They have different sized families. These are just a vast group of people. They're diverse, yet they're all in one central place because of God. And they've all come together for this reason. And it's when all of them have come together, this diverse group of people, is when God chooses to preach His message of the gospel, the glorious good news of Jesus Christ, His death and His resurrection for the first time. And so here we have a diverse group of people, keeping it moving. But next what we find out is this about these people. These are people who are diverse, and they, it's who's learned a life-changing truth. I try to make it one big sentence, but as you can see, I'm chopping it up a little bit as I share it. They're a diverse group of people who learned a life-changing truth. When Peter gets up to preach in verse 14, he shares with them a message that absolutely alters everything they know and think about their life. And it will go on for many of those people who are listening to change every aspect of their life. Not some of it, not part of it, not a day or a couple days. Everything about their life, it changes. And what was the life-altering or life-changing truth they learned? Well, two parts. Simply put this, one, they were guilty of his death. They learned they were guilty of his death. Look at Acts chapter 2, verse 22 and 23. Here's what Peter would say there. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through your midst, as you yourselves know, this Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. He says, everyone who's listening, you were guilty of his death. This Jesus that you knew, it's been over a month since Jesus had died on a cross. For one, these people have heard of Jesus. His, 
His name and his story had reached everywhere. They know of the stories of his miracles. That's why he talks to you about a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders. They've heard the stories of walking on water and, and the stories of calming the storms and healing people and, and casting out demons. They've heard this. They've also know the fact that this person was also hung upon a cross not very long ago. They've heard the stories and the rumors about what happened after his death too. But he says, this Jesus that you know about, that you've heard about, that many of you have experienced, that you've seen, that you've heard, he actually was the Son of God. You made a grave mistake. Have you ever had somebody come up to you and say, do you realize what you've done? You ever made a big mistake and it just hits you all at once? These people thought they were doing something good for God. Some of them did. And Peter says, absolutely not. The very God you proclaim to love, that you're trying to serve in this very moment, you killed him. You killed God who came in the flesh. You crucified him. You're guilty of his blood. You're guilty of his death. And that's one part of the life-changing truth, keeping it going. There's a second part to the life-changing truth. Not only were they guilty of his death, but they were also witnesses to his resurrection. Part of their story is that they were guilty of his death, but they were witnesses to his resurrection. Look at verse 29 in this chapter. Peter is, is making comments based upon the prophecy of David he has just quoted about, how, about the resurrection and about life after death. And Peter would say this, he says, Brothers, I may say to you with confidence about the patriarch David that he both died and was buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. Being therefore a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him, that he would set one of his descendants on his throne. He foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of Christ, that he was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God raised up, and of that we are all witnesses. He would say, Jews, you love your King David. Remember your patriarch, the one you look up to? He died, he was buried, and he's still in his tomb. But the man Jesus... He is not there. His body did not decay. His body did not corrupt. His body did not mysteriously go missing. It was not robbed. It was not stolen. It wasn't taken somewhere. No, that Jesus is alive. And he is well. And he would say, and of that, you are all witnesses. Some of these very people were the ones that were there on the day Jesus was crucified. Some of them might have played a part and putting him there. Some of them might have been the one to cry out for Barabbas' sake instead of Jesus's. But also, there are people in this audience, maybe, that had seen Jesus. We know that Jesus appeared to his apostles. The Bible also tells us he appeared to more than 500 at once. It may be that some of them saw resurrected Jesus, or it may be that all of them have heard the story. Maybe they've all went to the empty tomb. All of these people have heard the testimony from others, and this is spreading around the community. And he says, that Jesus has been, raised us, has been raised up, and you are all witnesses to that fact. God, or Jesus, really was the Christ, and he really defeated death. And then I want you to notice the last part of their story. They heard this life-changing truth. This life-changing truth that's just, I would have to imagine, has melted their mind. It probably feels like ice cream at this point. It's like, this has changed everything. And they decided to hear God's call and respond to it. Read verse 36 through 41. When they heard this, they were cut to the heart. It, it pricked them. It moved them. There was an immense feeling of guilt. And what in the world do we do? And so they said, brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said, repent and be baptized. Every one of you. In the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promises for you and for your children and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. And he continued saying, and with many other words, he bore witness and continued to exhort them, saying, save yourselves from this crooked generation. So those who received his word were baptized, and there were added that day about 3,000 souls. They wanted to fix the guilt they had. They wanted to be right with God. What do we do? So Peter gave them the gospel message that we preach often. To put your faith in Jesus, to repent, to turn to God, to immerse yourself in Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. Your guilt can be removed, he told them. 
And by doing so, receiving the Holy Spirit. And this is a promise for you. And he would say, and so they did it. Because in verse 41 it says, they received his word, they took it as truth, they obeyed it, and 3,000 souls were made Christians that day. They were added to the kingdom. And you're likely hearing all this going, I've heard this story a lot. <laughs> and that's true. But this has a lot to do with who we are as a church. You know, we are a diverse group of people, aren't we? I want you to think about who we are. Among us this morning, there are rich, there's poor, there's somewhere in between, there's levels of all of that. Among us this morning, we have men and we have women, and they're quite different from what I've gathered. Among us this morning, we have white, brown, pale, tan, we have black, every color in between, we find those in the church. Among us, we have married, we have divorced, we have widowed, we have single. Among us this morning, we have old, we have young, middle-aged, and I'll let you determine which category you fit. Among us, we have people who work as teachers, others who are nurses, we have servicemen and women, we have mothers, we have carpenters. I mean, we literally have a family that's named Carpenters. We have construction workers. We have people who do all sorts of things for a living. Some of us in this room, we're from Choctaw. Some from Luther, some from Midwest City, some from Hera, some from Moore. Some of us are from a place far, far away from here. Some of us have lived here our whole life. Some of us have moved around our whole life. Some of us come from a religious background. Some of us knew nothing of the sort before we became a part of this church. Some of us were raised in a Christian home. Some of us have no idea what that looks like. We're a diverse group of people. We might not look at ourselves sometimes and say, we're, we're diverse. I would beg to differ. We're people who come from all over to this one place. Why? Because Jesus. I would imagine that most of us in here would have nothing to do with each other if it wasn't for Jesus. I, we likely wouldn't know each other. We likely wouldn't have the relationship we have. We likely wouldn't participate in the same things. We would have nothing to talk about. But yet, because of Jesus, we are family. Because of Jesus, we have something in common. Because of Jesus, we have all been brought together to His praise and to His glory. We're a diverse group of people. And what brought us together is that we learned a life-changing truth. We learned a life-changing truth that you and I... We're guilty of Jesus' death. Every single one of us. We are guilty of his death. You and I were not there in 33. You and I did not shout out for Jesus to be crucified. You and I did not put the nail in his hands. You and I were not the ones that did that, right? Right? But yet, we are the ones who put him there, aren't we? How deep the Father's love for us, how vast beyond all measure. One line in that song that we love to sing is, it was my sin that held him there. He went to the cross not just for the sin of these people we read about, but for us. And we realize we're guilty of his death. We've all fallen short. Do you remember the moment that you realized your sin put Jesus on the cross? Do you remember the moment you learned about your sin? I'm not asking you to remember when you were five and you sang Jesus loves me and you heard about sin. I remember the moment you believed it. The moment you got a knot in your stomach because you realized what your sin had done and where you put Jesus and what he did for you. Do you remember that feeling of I've got to make this right? All of us have that in common because we learned a life changing truth that we were guilty. Look, we're made perfect in Christ. That's wonderful. But we certainly weren't perfect before Christ, and we don't even live perfect today. We're imperfect people who've been made perfect by Christ. But we learned we were guilty of His death, and, and also we learned we're witnesses to His resurrection. You and I cannot go see an empty tomb. You and I cannot have breakfast with Jesus on the shore like Peter got to. You and I don't get to talk to Jesus as He's resurrected. We're not witnesses in that way, but you know, we have heard the story. We've listened to the testimony. 
We've believed it, and we can't, go, we can't live life without thinking about it, without realizing that there is a God who loved us to the point to die, and He beat death, and He's resurrected. And in that way, you and I are witnesses to the power of God defeating death. And those life-altering truths made us respond to His call. When we heard that there was a way to be forgiven, we jumped at the chance. When we realized that our sins could be forgiven, but that that God that we love, that we could be united with Him, not only now, but forever, we responded. I can't wait to put my faith in Jesus. I can't wait to turn to Him. We, we immersed ourselves in Jesus because we all wanted to be right with God and be a part of His family. And if you notice verse 41, when they were baptized, not only did they receive that gift of the Holy Spirit, not only did they receive forgiveness, he says, they immediately were added to a kingdom. And so what's the point of us seeing their story and then saying, well, that's our story? Well, it's this. Church, I want us to remember why there's an us. Church, we are a kingdom. We're not a social club. We're a kingdom that has purposes and intentions. We don't meet here just to have some friendships. I love the friendships we make here. But that's not our point, just to have connections and chit-chat. We're a kingdom who has missions, who has purposes. Church, we are a movement, not a monument. Brother Chris McCurley said that once, and I love that quote. We're a movement, not a monument. We're not something dead that we remember fondly. We're alive. We're moving. We are active in our lives, in our community. We were meant to not sit still, but to be all around moving, being active for Jesus. Church, we are a people who serve, not a place you come to be served. Don't we have that all backward in society with church? I'm going to go church shopping so I can find the best place to serve me. But when I look at the church in the New Testament, that's a place where because of Jesus, I, I hunker down, I get invested, and I'm going to serve God and serve people there. We're a people who serve, not just a place to be served. Church isn't a place we go. It's who we are. I know we forget that sometimes because, and we even talk about it some ways. I'm going, I'm going to church. I do that too. Church is that thing we do two times on Sunday, once on Wednesday, if we do that. No. We're a people. We're not a place. God made us into something special. Why did He make us in us? Well, because He has plans for you and I. He has, somewhat, he has something we want. He wants us to be something for Him. We were saved from something to be something. Not just to sit here and be like, hey, God is great. Woo. Let's just go back to however we were living our lives. Let's not make a difference for people. No. We were meant to be something. Why is there in us? Well, because God loved us enough to save us, and God has plans for us to live and work for Him. There is an us because of a deep love from Jesus and our deep love for Jesus. There is an us because Jesus changed our life. That's why we're here, right? Jesus changed us. There is an us because Jesus has called us to live for Him. There is an us because God has work to do. And I think the only way we'll ever be the church God really desires us to be is if we remember that. We're not here just to check off a list. We're not here just to fill in the three hours of our week to have the spiritual segment of our life. No, we are here because we are deeply and madly in love with God. And He's what brought us into a relationship with Him, and we want to live our lives for him. Jesus saved our souls. He changed our life. He gave us the best life possible in Christ. Do we believe that he can still do that today? Do we believe that people need that Jesus today? Then man, there's a church we need to be. My hope is through this series, we discover who the church is. What were they all about? It might be that some of those very things we're all about right now. It might be some of the things that we're supposed to be all about as we look at the New Testament church. Maybe we've forgotten or we're not exactly that right now. That's okay. We're going to discover it. But I want all of us to be able at the end of this series to say, this is us. 
This is who we are. This is what we're about for Jesus. And this is what we're trying to be. And all of us can move forward in the same direction. And I promise you, when a whole church body knows who they are and knows what they're trying to be about, the community better watch out. That's a church you cannot ignore when everyone is deeply in love with Jesus and they know what they're supposed to be about. So may we never forget this morning why there's in us. And I hope that in the way that we sometimes get bogged down with routine and sometimes we we come because we're just, this is what we always do. I hope we'll maybe snap out of it this morning and, and not forget why we're here. Why we are the Church of Christ in Choctaw. Why, why we're a part of this body. And may we never forget it. Because all the things that we're going to talk about of who we are, about this is us, Jesus is our motivation. He is the reason for who we are. He is why we are what we are. I hope you remember that this morning, and I hope you'll remember that in the weeks to come. So start thinking about now, who are we and what are we about? And I pray that in the coming weeks, we shed some light on it, and it will uh, spark us to be the church God designs for us to be. Are you all with me this morning? I just hope that's clear. I just, I just want us to be on the same page as we move forward. Uh, this morning, there's not a big necessarily application for you to go do besides remember why you are. Remember why there's in us and remember why we're here this morning. But I will say it might be this morning that you're sitting in the audience and you're like, I don't know if I'm a part of that us. It might be that you say, I, don't, I didn't do what we read about today. There's a gospel message that was preached and I, I haven't done that. If you want to be a part of us, if you want to be a part of Jesus' people, be saved with Him. We would love nothing more than to help you do that. That might be something you want to do right now publicly. It might be a little scary for you to do and you want to talk to us about it. Just find someone who looks friendly after service. Just talk to someone who looks like they know what they're doing. That might not be me, but just talk to somebody. We'd love to help you. It might be that you are searching for a church family to be a part of. Can I tell you, there's a lot of great people here at the Choctaw Church of Christ. And we would love for you to help uh, to be a part of our family and to discover who we are together in the coming weeks. Or maybe life right now has just been difficult. We would love to be a family who cares for you, who prays for you, and loves you this morning. But if you have a need, whether it's to become a part of us, to uh, ask for prayers for a difficult situation, or to become a part of Jesus' people, whatever it may be, come now while we stand and while we sing.